Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. I hope you're having a wonderful morning. I certainly am. It's always a joy and a privilege to be able to bring a message from the Word of God to God's people. Questions are powerful tools of instruction. They often appear to, I don't want to trigger anything in the audience, but that's basically what tests are and exams. I always caution into that because I was one of those geeks. I, I love tests. I love being at school and them saying, there's going to be a pop quiz today. Excellent. I look forward to that. Why? God gave me a pretty good memory. I could probably do pretty okay with that. But powerful tools of instruction. When you've heard of the so-called Socratic method, what is the Socratic method? It is a vigorous and rigorous questioning to see not only do you know what you're talking about, but can you defend it? My sister Stephanie, that most of you here at the church know, Stephanie, I almost said Bennett, Stephanie Bennett Nelson, um, just defended her doctorate thesis. Well, what's that about? It is a vigorous and rigorous questioning of the thesis that she was put in, putting forward. And just to let you know, she succeeded in defending it and all looks well. So questions are powerful tools of instruction. Jesus used questions so often. How often do we see in the Bible him answering questions with what? With questions. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, the, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, you know, good teacher, what, what good thing must I do to, to gain everlasting life? And how did Jesus answer him? He said, why are you calling me good? I'm trying to get that young man to understand. Do you understand what you said? Questions are powerful. And this morning, we're going to talk about the most important and powerful question there is. And it was the question that our Lord asked the twelve. Do you also want to go away? What makes this question so powerful is that our answer to it is the difference between everlasting life in that place we call heaven, that place described with streets of gold and, and gates of precious gems, no darkness, no night, no pain, no tears, or an everlasting destruction from the presence of our Lord. Our answer to this question is what determines our faith. So, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, if you want to follow along, John chapter 6, verse 67 is where the question is posed. We're going to begin earlier. We're going to consider this question in its fullness. And we're going to make application that this question is from the beginning in the garden until the end, the same question God asks every man, every woman. We're going to talk about it with regards to the encounter. The encounter with Jesus. Then we're going to talk about the challenge from Jesus. And then we're going to talk about this question of Jesus's. To begin, the encounter. What's the context of John chapter 6? John chapters 1 through 5. John chapter 1, what do we have? We have that great theological introduction by uh, John, the son of Zebedee, the author. And then we have the witness of John the Immerser. John chapter 2, what do we have? We have the first miracle that John records at the wedding in Cana. And, and then we have Jesus cleansing the temple. Then John chapter 3, we have Jesus' um, encounter with Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin. And, and what did he say? He said that the reason he came to Jesus is because he had seen the works of Jesus and he knew that such a person must be from God. And then what happened? And then, then we had John the Immerser again, bearing witness that this Jesus is the Christ. John chapter 4, 
Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well. One of the few times where he landed the plane in conversation and said, I am the Messiah. And then later, he healed a nobleman's son that was sick unto death. John chapter 5. Jesus heals that man at the pool of Bethesda. Remember, the man couldn't get to the pool in time. And Jesus healed him. And then the rest of John chapter 5, Jesus gives the witnesses, the proofs that he was indeed who he said he was. That brings us to John chapter 6. So the context is the people are seeing. They are understanding this Jesus is not just some guy. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 2. It's on the screen as well. Then a great multitude followed Jesus because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. They had heard of everything else we just talked about. And again, what is the purpose of the miraculous here? Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew 16 and verse 20 and in Hebrews chapter, um, uh, just lost it, 2 and verse 4, it's to prove that this speaker, this individual is indeed from God. It's God's way of working with and confirming that individual. They are seeing it. And then after that, here in chapter 6, Jesus goes on and performs yet another miracle and feeds the 5,000 plus. Why 5,000 plus? It says there were about 5,000 men. I'm assuming there were women and children around as well. So another miracle is performed. The people have encountered Jesus. He has shown them that he is more than just a man. And then he challenged them. He's going to challenge their understanding. He's going to challenge their integrity. Look at verse 14 of chapter 6. The encounter with Jesus is bearing fruit. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, the feeding of the 5,000 plus, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. The translation I have in the New King James, the word prophet is capitalized. It may if you have an older version, it's probably capitalized. If you have a newer version, it's probably not. But the reference there, the reason it's capitalized, is it's referring back to the, the promise that God gave to Moses that he would raise a prophet up from among them like Moses, that he would put his words in this man's mouths, he would speak to the people, and God would hold them accountable to that. You remember in John chapter 1, the Jewish leaders came to John the Immerser, and you remember one of the first questions they asked him? Are you the prophet? Because they were looking for that prophet to come. And the people here are saying, this must be the guy. They're starting to put the signs together. Look at verse 25. And when the people found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Remember the situation? He had sent his, the twelve over across Galilee on their own. And then he, unbeknownst to the people, had walked across Galilee. There had been no other boats, and the people now see Jesus there on the other side. They understand. Rabbi, how did you get here? They understand another miracle has occurred. So it's bearing fruit. They're starting to say, this man is something special. This man, could he not be the prophet? In other places we read, is the Messiah going to do any greater deeds than these? So it's starting to bear fruit, but doubt still remains. Look at verse 26. So they asked him, how did you get here, Jesus? And Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, 
which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He challenged them, didn't he? He said, why are you really interested? Why are you following me? Why are you trying to figure out how I got over here? It's just because I fed you, isn't it? It's just because you're looking for food, isn't it? I'm telling you, don't work just for the food which perishes, but work for that food which comes from the Father. And they take it. And, and kind of like Nicodemus, they misunderstand. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And I know it's not there, but I hear the drudgery in that question. Fine. What do you want me to do? Right? And a misunderstanding of what Jesus has just said. Jesus responds. He answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And we understand that believe is more than this simple mental assent. Jesus is saying, you suspect who I am. You are following me as if you know who I am. You have to believe who I am, and that means you're going to obey what I say. And, and what has he been saying? You understand that what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's chapters 5 through 7, that Jesus probably preached that several hundred times in the three years. We have it recorded in Luke in a slightly different form because, again, it's a common message. What are the commandments of this man, Jesus, who's not just a man, but the Son of God, the promised Messiah? Well, he starts the Sermon on the Mount by talking about the kind of people God's people must be, the heart they must have. Then he talks about the natural expressions of that heart and how we should be able to see it. And then he warns them about religious hypocrisy, such a problem. Thank goodness, right, it was just a problem then, not today, right? Um, he warned them about religious hypocrisy. And he warned them about false teachers. And then he ended by saying what? Choose. Whom will you follow? It's a question, isn't it? So Jesus has been teaching that, and he says, what you need to do in order to get what you say you're looking for is you need to believe me. He went on. Verse 30, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. A sad testimony of mankind there. How did they respond to his deeply challenging spiritual message? Okay, you're asking an awful lot of us. Um, so what are you going to do to make us do it? What, what trick are you going to do? Okay, they, they'd already seen the miracle, right? Of at least the feeding of the 5,000 plus. They already are suspecting that there was another miracle that he somehow crossed the Galilee without... Um, without being in a boat. So what are they doing? They're, they're kind of playing the fool. And, and then they're kind of telling on themselves, aren't they? If you're the great prophet like Moses, you know what Moses did? He fed us for 40 years. Feed us. Keep feeding us. You did it just once. Keep feeding us. They're missing it. They're basically talking about the bread king again. You want to have our allegiance? You want us to be believers on you and followers uh, of yours? Give us stuff. Isn't that the problem Israel struggled with for so long? Isn't that what we see in the world in general? You need to come to God that you might be saved. And the response by mankind is, with them! What's in it for me? With them. What about the everlasting life? Yeah, 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 yeah. But what about right now? That misunderstanding of Nicodemus, right? What did Nicodemus say? He said, uh, I had to be born again. 
How is it possible for me to enter again into my mother's womb? Come on, Nicodemus. How about the woman at the well? If you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for the waters because I have everlasting waters. You'll never thirst again. And what did she say? Give me some of that water. Come on. Listen to Jesus' response. Talk about challenging. And Jesus said to them, uh, verse 32, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. I'm going to stop there for a second. I think there's two parts to that. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven because Jesus is talking in a spiritual sense, so that's not what Moses gave them. Moses just gave them bread. But at the same time, there's also the aspect, Moses didn't give you that bread. It was God who gave you that bread. So Jesus makes that plain. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And again, they kind of, playing the fool there, like the woman at the well, give us this bread always. You've got bread that we'll always have? Give me this bread. Jesus said to them, and again, it's not there, but you can see it. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will who sent him, of him who sent him, sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Pretty much landed the plane there, didn't he? You have seen the Son, and I told you to believe. That's the works of the Father, and you're not believing. You're seeing only physically. He just challenged them. And what's their response? Verse 41, then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread of heaven which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, he hath, I have come down from heaven? Jesus engages them. He tries again. He says, stop murmuring above yourselves. Have you forgotten all the things that brought you to me? All the things you've seen from me, don't forget that. But I am telling you that I am the one. Verse 50, again, you can see him pointing at himself. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The repetition in this chapter, church, better make our ears perk up. He has made this point powerful. I am the bread of life. You have to take of me everything that I am, like I am bread. Just as with physical bread, you take it in and it nourishes and strengthens you and gives you life. I am the the spiritual bread that came down from heaven, you must take all of me in, I will nourish you, and you will never die. And how do they respond? They encountered Jesus. They've been challenged by him. What's their ultimate response? They reject him. They reject the promised Messiah. Why? He performed the miracles. He taught what God had taught and, and, and given them in the Old Testament to look forward to because he asked too much from them, according to their opinion. They wanted a bread king. They wanted things in this life to be the way they wanted it to be. 
not some spiritual kingdom. So they purely took him physically. This man is advocating cannibalism. How repugnant. And they left him. And, and not just the crowds. Look at verse 66. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Even his disciples, many of them, said, this is a difficult saying. Who can take it in? I don't understand where this is going. I'm, let's land the plane, I'm not willing to give what he's asking me to give. And so they left him. The promised Messiah. They've seen the signs. They failed in their challenge. And that led to the question. Jesus turns to the remaining, the twelve. And he asks them, do you also want to go away? And you've heard me say it many times. It's not written, and I probably shouldn't speak for others, so I'll just say, if I was one of these 12, here's what would have been going through my head. Yes, I do want to go away. What you're asking from me seems beyond what I'm able to do and what I'm able to give. If you could promise me physical armor and protection and sustenance for the rest of the days of my life so that I would never even die physically. But that's not what you're telling me. You're telling me it's blessed to lay down my life for others. You're telling me I need to love God with all that I am. I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself and, and that I may die physically, but I will never truly die because I will go to heaven. You will raise me up in the last day. I haven't seen that happen a lot with my eyes. I've read it and I understand what you're saying, that's a degree of trust I just don't have right now. But, listen to Peter. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know, notice that word, know, that you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. That would have been the second thing. Well, that would have been the thing I actually said if I was one of the twelve. But I would have had that first thought. Because isn't that what Peter said? Do you also want to go away? Where else can we go? Where else is there a source for everlasting life? I understand maybe the path to that everlasting life is, is not the path I, I, I thought it would be. Maybe it's going to be a little more difficult than I thought it would be, but you're the only purveyor of such everlasting life. You're the only source, the only one I can come to. We have come to believe that you indeed are the Messiah, and so it's only through you. We believe beyond that that you are the Son of God, thus you share in His nature. We've seen, sharing his nature, we've seen you perform the miracles which prove that. So we believe, we know, but as I was talking with the kids in the, in the Bible class, this same Peter in Matthew chapter 16, in the span of what, about 15 minutes, went from saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus saying to him, Simon Barjona, blessed are you. You've understood it. Fifteen minutes later, what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Well, what happened? Peter understood. Said he understood. Said he knew that he was the Son of God. Well, what happened? Jesus started talking about the death that he would die. And what did Peter say? Peter, after saying he understood Jesus was the Son of God, took it on himself to rebuke 
the Son of God. That's not going to happen to you. You stop talking about that. So no. They knew. But they knew. There's the question. And there's their answer. And again, good on Peter for that answer. But we who have studied our Bibles understand this question has not been fully answered by Peter till the end of this book. Because there's going to be three times when he's asked a certain question that he's not going to do so well, is he? He's going to fail there. And then Jesus is going to appear, the resurrected Jesus is going to appear to him and ask him three questions. And at that third time, Peter's going to be weeping, saying, why are you doing this to me? Because you said you knew. But then you didn't. Now you say you do. Well, do you? That's what happened there. What about us today or mankind forever? We encounter God. Differently depending on when we live. We are blessed to live in the Christian system, the age of Christianity, where we get to encounter God via His Son. Think of Hebrews chapter 1, right? God has spoken to the prophets and fathers in various ways, but now talk to us through His Son. So we get to come to God through the Father. We encounter Jesus. How do we encounter Him today? Sadly, He doesn't just walk and talk. We don't get to see, but we get to see all this. And as this same apostle, this same author, John, wrote toward the end, Jesus did many, many other things. That if we documented everything that he had did, the world itself probably couldn't hold all the books. But these have been written that you may believe. And isn't that what Jesus said to the crowd that day? What do you need to do? You need to believe on the one the Father sent. So we encounter Jesus. And we have such a fullness so that our encounter, we can see him in the book of Genesis. We can see him through the book of Revelation. We see it all laid out before us. And all we have to do is follow him unto everlasting life. Oh, whoops. I, I missed a couple of things. We have to deny ourselves daily, take up a cross, and follow him. Oh. Wait, what, what was that cross part? There's the challenge of Jesus. Would you be mine? Yes, Lord. You've forgiven me my sins. You've promised me everlasting life. You've given me understanding and knowledge that the world has always been begging for, and I, I have it all. You know, prophets, angels desired to look into these things, which we have at our fingertips. And he says, fantastic. Then be like me. And as you've heard me say, absolutely, I want to be like Jesus. I want to teach. I want to help. I want to comfort. I want to console. You want to be persecuted, um, go under tribulation and suffer and die? Well, well no, not that part. I, I want to do this other part. But it's all a part. And that's why, unfortunately, the answer to this question, do you also want to go away? All too often, even among the Lord's people, is yes. And they leave. Despite the fact there is nowhere else to go. Where are you going to seek everlasting life? The continued forgiveness of your sins. Chicken soup for the soul? You going to find it in there? Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People? You going to find it in there? You're not. This is the only place and the only source. And again, this question from the beginning to the end is the question. Because think about the garden, church. Adam and Eve, in the very presence of God, enjoying everlasting life, have access to the tree of life. What was the, the question to them? Do you want to go away? If you do, here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just eat of its fruit and you'll go away. And what did they do? They 
went away. Israel's history, we're studying the beginning of it. They're starting out great, but we know, we know how that's going to go. So today, have you encountered Jesus? Do you know our Lord? Do you know the truth of who He was, who He is, what He has done, and what He holds in store? If so, here's the challenge. Will you deny yourself? Will you put God first and foremost and others before yourself? Unto everlasting life, but every minute of every day? Or do you want to go away? Will you choose God's will? Or will you seek to usurp God and follow your own? Or maybe you'll choose the path of the hypocrite and pervert God's will to make it your own. Make His conform to yours. There's a question there. Will you listen to the flesh? Or will you listen to what the Spirit has revealed and what our mind can know? And ultimately, what are you living for? For heaven? Or for this world? Well, as that same author John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, bad news, this world is passing away. And the love of it, don't tie yourself to it. Live for heaven. As Brother DeBerry says, you've heard me say, payday someday, not today. Payday someday. Live unto everlasting life. How will you answer the question? If you're not a Christian this morning, you stand separated from God because of your sin. But God loves you so much that He sent His only Son to come into this world to suffer and die, to pay the price for your sin, that God's will may be fulfilled and you may be reconciled forever. If you've never done that, why not this morning? Christians, don't be deceived by the foolishness of riches, the passing pleasures of sin. Don't let anything take your eye off the prize, which is by way of a cross, but is heaven. If you've been distracted, if you haven't been doing what you ought, turn back. If there's anything we 